Hey, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the March 16th, 2021 uh, Lewiston City Council Workshop and our regular business meeting. Uh, for those, uh, this session will be conducted remotely and council members will participate electronically. For those viewing online, please ensure that you join this meeting using the following website, www.lewistonmaine.gov slash 2021cc. If you joined this meeting using any other link, we encourage you to sign on through that website. Public comment on any item appearing on the agenda will be sent to public comment at lewistonmaine.gov prior to or during the meeting and all comments received will be forwarded to the city council. And members of the public who are logged into the meeting online can make comments when invited to do so by raising your hand. Uh, the button is typically at the lower center of your screen. Once you're acknowledged, uh, your microphone will be unmuted. Uh, you may also have to mute it, unmute it on your end. And counselors are asked to raise their hands uh, to make comments. And with that said, we're gonna move to our workshop, item A, which is uh, the 2022 uh, city budget presentation. And I'll turn this over initially to Dennis. Evening, uh, Mayor and City Councilors. Um, but, uh, as you know, we're required on an annual basis to present the um, budget to you. And uh, this is our process. This is our presentation this evening. If you bear with me for one second, I'm going to share my screen and get our presentation going. I do have um, Director Hunter that will uh, also help me with this uh, presentation this evening. And Okay, we'll go ahead and get started here. Good evening again. Um, starting out here, we're looking at our proposed budget um, is proposing a $40,369,344 in operating, a debt service, $7,376,213 for a total of $47,745,557 or a 2.18% increase over last year. We'll get into uh, most notable on this slide. I just want to note that debt service saw a significant reduction of one million seven hundred sixty-one thousand three hundred forty-three dollars. That we will, um, Director Hunter will be able to cover in more detail in later slides, and we also will cover some of these uh, budget drivers under the operating side in some later slides coming up here. Department requests uh, total was two two point nine two million was cut from the department request that originally came in. 200 of that $218,000 or a little bit over that was uh, of requests were completely cut from the budget um, and $2,697,855 were recommended to be funded through fund balance. In your budget books on page 35 and 36, you'll see a full listing and breakdown of these requests and, 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 the, um, and the amounts next to each of those. Under expenditures, personnel is up $1,413,000, a little over $1,413,000. Uh, biggest drivers within the personnel is our, uh, there was 12 frozen positions from last year's budget that have been reinstated. That is by far the biggest increase there, um, under, again, under personnel. Also, uh, public safety overtime and uh, it's, it's certainly been up as well as uh, we have negotiated salaries and all of our union contracts that's reflected in there as well. Fringe benefits are up $604,751. Um, we what uh, experiencing healthcare and retirement cost increases there. And again, um, debt service is down $1,761,343. Um, and, you know, we'll, um, I'll actually ask uh, Director Hunter if she wants to maybe give a little bit more detail on that uh, for all of you. You're on mute. There we go. Sorry about that. The pension bond that the city, when the main state retirement system consolidated in PLDs and each municipality was signed an, an unfunded liability, 
Um, the city paid Maine State retirement for a number of years and then found it was more cost effective to actually issue debt service for that unfunded liability. Um, that debt service was amortized. We've refunded it um, at least once and paid down a lump sum of a million dollars. I'm happy to say that this is the last payment was uh, made in FY21. The savings that you're seeing there is pretty much the annual cost of that debt service payment. It, it was a, a rather large one. Thank, thank you, Heather. Uh, moving on with expenditures, joint agencies are down a little over $136,000. Biggest driver there is uh, we experienced an opportunity to carry forward CARES Act funding in our uh, transit committee at the uh, tune of that dropped the budget from to 170 or excuse me, dropped it by $173,135. Um, saw some other increases in uh, overall in other joint agencies, but by that uh, certainly uh, allowed us to have a, a complete uh, $136,000 reduction in joint agencies overall. Supplies are up $63,404. Biggest drivers there is fuel pricing. Um, we did see an increase there. We had our contract pricing come in about $23,000 uh, increase there. Construction materials for winter operations is up just shy of $10,000 at $9,800. And uh, streetlight uh, parts inventory was up uh, $16,500 under supplies. Contractual services up uh, 492, sorry, $492,054. Um, mainly, uh, the biggest drivers in there is our maintenance and licensing regarding uh, all of our citywide software. Um, also included in that is our the new uh, police body cam contract um, that uh, we recently approved, uh, you know, at the end of uh, 2020. And I'm going to move on and ask uh, Director Hunter to cover the city revenues. Certainly, um, you will see the city revenues are up 7.56%, are $906,000. Um, all of that increase is dedicated to state revenue sharing. As you can see, um, we have yet to really experience the drastic downward trend that we thought as a result to COVID, we would be able to see um, at least some of that by now, I would think. And we, so far we have not experienced, experienced that. We also have auto excise tax that is up about a quarter of a million dollars. General assistant aid from the state is up $20,000. That relates to the 70% reimbursement for general assistance costs. So at that point in time, you will note that GA services and expenditures increased by $29,000. Other licensing and permit rose by $78,000. That includes a lot of the marijuana and grow operations. Um, all parking related revenue is down $345,000. That includes all parking garages, uh, parking meters, and parking violations. We are seeing not only with the remote working and um, problems with the software at the parking garage, that all of those um, parking related revenues have, have really taken a nosedive this year, unfortunately. The apartment trash building uh, billing program rose by about 30,500. And we expect based upon what we're seeing right now, although we're right in the throes of food service licensing renewals, we're anticipating that dropping about $15,000. Under a new program request, we had a total uh, request of $1,162,110. I'm gonna also ask uh, Director Hunter to uh, cover these and run through the, uh, the new programs and requests that we received. Certainly. On page 18 of your budget document, you will find a complete listing of these new programs and services. As we um, approach each department workshop, we'll be discussing that department's request that evening. 
Um, the council was also sent a file that cre uh, contains all the narrative explanations of each one of those requests. So looking through there, um, you will see new positions and additional labor totaled $647,000 contractual services were 419,700. Technology related was a little over 75,000 and supplies were 20,000. Part of that includes um, eight full-time equivalent positions, three part-time positions for the new labor and positions. The contractual service includes a number of maintenance and licensing items as well as two um, crisis workers that the police department spoke with you about. So that is in that number as well. And then supplies includes things like um, replacing the decorative trash um, receptacles throughout the downtown area. Um, also noted on there is the utility funds. Normally, um, some years we don't have any fund request or any new requests from the utility funds. This year we happen to have two hundred and thirty-five thousand seven hundred or four hundred and seventy dollars. That includes a position and a half that's been requested, and three requests for various software and technical upgrades, as well as a purchase of a drone and training and insurance that goes along with that. Capital expenditures. Um, right now, we are recommending no capital expenditures be funded out of the operating budget. Um, this is something that I know you've heard over the years, and we've certainly talked about it. It is a desire for us to have uh, more capital expenditures included in our operating budget, but you know, budgets in recent years have just not really allowed that or been been able to do that. Um, fund balance is three million nine hundred eighty-eight thousand one hundred five dollars. City bonds were proposing $6,093,341 and school bonds are $5,495,000. <clears throat> Moving on to the fund balance analysis, I'm going to ask uh, Director Hunter to walk us all through this, uh, the fund balance analysis on this slide. Certainly, um, as you might recall, we've talked about, we have a fund balance policy and the policy establishes a floor of 8% of revenues and transfers and a ceiling of 12%. So if you go through the calculation, um, right now our unassigned fund balance is $20,513,061. The revenues and transfers, and just to be clear, this is all of general funds. So that includes the school department's revenues and transfers as well as general funds. So what happens is as they increase their revenue sources to stay compliant within the policy, we need to increase our unassigned balance. So that's how that relationship works. And you will see how the numbers work out with the floor and the ceiling of eight and 12. Right now we're proposing to use a little under $4 million, which reduces the 14 point 38% down to 11.59% at this rate. I know in the past, we've kind of always talked, talked about that sweet spot being 10%. That leaves us about two point, just shot a little under $2.3 million um, available to work, look at. Coming through the budget right now, there are not a lot of other eligible items that could be moved to fund balance. Um, what the council could do is look at some of the new program and requests if they qualify under that definition. But I would caution you, some of those items may have a budgetary impact on FY23. So for example, if we bought a software program this year in FY23, it might have a maintenance and licensing um, cost that we would have to absorb within the offer operating budget. The other option would be if council wanted to move additional LCIP items to the fund balance. We ha you will notice when we look, you look on your capital page, we have moved some already 
Um, and once you, we go through this process, we can determine if more needs to be moved over. Moving on to the school department, total revenues are up $1,157,505. Or 1.79%, apologize. My working with Zoom here is uh, creating a challenge. Uh, carry forward up $2,031,388 or 51.5%. And total expenditures are up $6,215,893 or 6.95%. I am going to ask uh, Director Hunter to cover the next two slides. So the city has two budget limitations that are placed upon us when we go through this process. The first is the GMP IPD calculation and that is required or that language is included in the city charter. And that is the gross national product implicit price defader. And it's based upon the 12 months ending or the change in the 12 months ending September, 2020. So that change in that measurement increased by 1.28%. So per the charter, that is what our expenditure side of the house can change by and not require a super majority vote. Unfortunately, right now the city increases at 2.11. The school side is under 7%, and then the combined places us at 5.22%. So we will need five votes to approve this budget at this point. If we want to comply with the GMP IPD, we would need to, between the city and school, cut about $5.5 million. Um, the one kind of negative part of this calculation, in theory, it's a good, um, budget control, but it basically looks at expenditures only. So if we had revenue that increased that and allowed us to pay for those additional expenditures, this particular calculation does not take that in, into consideration. It only looks at expenditures. Conversely, the next slide <laughs> talks about the state tax LD1. That is our second limitation, and that's required by the state of Maine on all um, municipal operating costs. So the county is excluded and the school department is excluded in this calculation. And it's based upon the tax levy. So that takes it to, into consideration both expenditures and increase in non-tax revenue when you're looking at this uh, uh, calculation here. So you will see it's based upon two growth patterns. One is personal income growth, which is set at 3.3%. And then our property growth, which um, our chief assessor has established a 1.1% at this time. So we are allowed to increase our budget by 4.4%. Currently, we are at 5.33%. However, in prior years, when we have been under the limit, we are allowed to carry forward that surplus into future years. So if you will note, right now, our proposed FY22 uh, LD1 calculation says we're at 34,847,401. Our calculated limit carrying forward those surpluses from prior years is $52 million. So we have plenty of room under the LD1 within this budget. Assessed value is up just over a half a percent at, uh, or $11 million. County tax is, uh, is, has an increase of 0.91% or one cent on the tax rate at $3,012,240. Our projected tax rate um, is at, currently we sit at $28.67. The projected tax rate is $30.93, um, which represents a $2.26 increase or 7.87% increase overall. 
Enterprise funds uh, underwater, we have uh, revenues at $6,300,686. Expenditures just, just shy of that uh, with a difference of $1,321. Our projected FY22 ending cash is $641,831 for water. Sewer is uh, six, revenues uh, stand at $6,563,704 and expenditures at $7,178,704, the difference of negative uh, $615,000. Our projected FY22 ending cash is $799,813. Moving on to stormwater, we had revenues at $3 million, expenditures at uh, $3,595,200, uh, projected FY22 ending cash is $974,399. I'm going to ask uh, Director Director Hunter to uh, walk us through that one as well. Uh, walk through some highlights around enterprise funds, or yeah, certainly. Um, a couple things on this particular slide. You will Sorry. know. Well, I can work with that one. Go ahead. <laughs> um, you will notice um, the asterisks. This is assuming a 23% water rate increase. Um, in order to provide an additional million sixty thousand dollars to cover the additional operating expenses, which are up by eight hundred and sixty thousand dollars, are fifteen point eight two percent. As you might recall, when we were discussing FY twenty one's budget, we were able to kind of do a stopgap with all of the utilities to make sure there were no increases, along with the actual tax decrease for FY21. All through that workshop, we talked about how we would only be able to do particularly water for one year. Um, and we froze all positions, we froze all capital purchases and so forth. Um, we are now kind of making up for that um, with a rate increase this year because we do have Capital expenses, you will see, are up by $618,000. Um, and other operating expenses are a little over $88,000. Debt service isn't too bad. It, it rose by $24,600. And payroll and French benefits are up about 7.8% or $129,000 or $129,000. This will have to um, be evaluated as we move forward, but I'm thinking it may not necessarily be 23% after we get through budget deliberations, but we will still have and still need a water rate increase. Of our three utilities, the water fund is the only one that's regulated by PUC. So there is a, a specific process which we need to go through when we do water rate increases. So the first thing is once we've done this, we, about April 16th, we need to look at providing notices and public hearings and sending the information up to PUC. On May 5th or 3rd, we actually have to mail all of the water customers and let them know about the proposed rate increase and let them know when the public hearing will take place and we'll advertise that in the newspaper as well. May 18th is when we're scheduled to approve the water sewer and stormwater budgets. At that point in time, that's also when we'll have the public hearing and evaluate the rate case or the rate increase at that point in time. My suggestion is that we would actually approve the rate increase prior to approving the budget. Because if we do it in reverse order, we would have a budget that we might not have money to pay for. So that's why we would want to consider doing it in that order. Um, at that point in time, we have a 10 day waiting period for the PUC um, to make sure everything is, they are not hearing any um, significant complaints that warrant further investigation from the public advocacy office. And that enables us to implement the rate increases July 1st. With the stormwater, water, sewer and stormwater, the billing, it is a phased in approach. 
So it takes us a full quarter before we even get to that rate increase. So that's why you will see a marginal in, uh, revenue increase about 75% of the full value of the rate increase until we have one full year under our belt. Under the sewer utility, we are not projecting a rate increase at this time. Revenues are down about $34,000 and expenses are up by $161,000. Um, the lion's share of that is, as you will notice, in that capital item where we froze all the capital last year. We are seeing that impact these budgets this year. So capital is up $127,500. The treatment plant pretty much offsets that increase. Um, that is down by just shy of $127,000. Operating expenses rose by $133,000. Debt services up slightly by 17, and payroll and benefits are up about $9,700, $9,800. Again, no rate increases recommended at this time. There's enough cash on hand to satisfy the operating deficit. Similarly, stormwater has the same situation. Again, we are not recommending a rate increase. Revenues are flat at $3 million. Expenses are up by $368,000 or 11%. You will see the driving costs there are the capital outlay, $397,500. And then the operating expenses are, that have risen by $26,000. Those are offset by debt service decrease and payroll debt decreases of essentially $55,000 between the two. So again, we're not recommending a rate increase because we have sufficient cash in order to cover that operating deficit for this year. Thank you, Director Hunter. And this concludes our budget presentation. Um, but I do want to end it with a very strong uh, thank you to the department heads, uh, particularly uh, Director Hunter, who participated in this presentation uh, tonight and appreciated her participation. But the work uh, leading up to this by herself, um, the finance department, all of the department heads, um, through, uh, through while navigating a pandemic, um, everything else that we have going on, I'm just uh, very pleased and, and proud to uh, present this evening to you and uh, through all their hard work. Um, and I also just wanted to note a fun fact that um, we are almost exactly one year uh, to date since we had our, uh, it was March 17th, 2020, when we presented the budget. And that just happened to be the last time that we were all face to face in our council chambers. Uh, since then, we've been remote um, in all of our meetings since then. So. Um, one year, almost exactly to the day, so tomorrow. So uh, thank you all, and I will stop sharing my screen. Okay. Uh, thank you, City Administrator Dote and Finance Director Hunter. Uh, questions or comments from the council? I, uh, I have a few. Uh, so the, uh, the gross national product, uh, if we go, if we have a budget that's over 1.28, we have to go to a super majority. Uh, previously during my council time, I don't recall ever meeting that. Did City Administrator Dote or Heather, have we ever met that in your? Have, have we ever been under the IPD? Right. I think it, in the 30 some years I've been here, I think it's maybe happened twice. Okay. But it has happened. In a long time ago? I mean, has it been a um, decade? It depends or... on where the economy is. Typically, you see the GMP IPD increase during um, high inflationary times. Right now, we're not experiencing that. That's why it's so low. All right. Thank you. Uh, in reference to enterprise funds, does, do those budgets go through the same scrutiny that all department heads budgets go through by city administration? We, we certainly go through, I mean, know that uh, we review those with, um, with the departments, yes. I mean, I think those are treated and, and reviewed the same. Okay, thanks. 
And then I noticed revenues down in sewer, but what was it in water? Was revenue flat or was it above? It was down like $30,000. Um, so that would explain why revenue is down in the following utility. Correct. Like, okay. And then the last thing, I know at some point we're gonna be starting a list and I'd like to put something on the list right off. Certainly. Uh, I'd like to see, uh, so we have 12 positions in the budget that were not filled previously, right? That's correct. And those are the positions that previous councils had created but had not funded, is that correct? Is that a fair statement? It, um, it's a combination. Um, some of the position, it, at that point in time last year, it were, they were positions that were vacant. Okay. So some of them were new positions that had not been filled yet. Others were newly vacated positions that we froze. Okay. So could we, could you provide the council a list of positions, including the uh, new programs and services positions, the, the previous 12 that are currently in the budget, in a prioritization order. So what administration believes, you know, should be the top priority. And then so that when councils are looking at all these positions, at least we'll have that, that guidance on priorities. And that's all I have. Thank you, uh, Councillor Jensen. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm just curious if we have the percentage of the overall budget increase from not last year's budget, but the previous year, because I know last year we actually had a, I think, reduction. Um, so I was just kind of curious what the, compared to the previous year. Give me one second. <laughs> there is an advantage of being on Zoom. <laughs> I still feel like we should have the Jeopardy theme music when she gets put on the spot like this and, you know, have that be playing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One thing I will take an opportunity while I'm flipping through here is um, to the mayor's point, anything that the, any council wants to, counselor wants to revisit, let me know and we can put that up kind of on the parking lot and then we'll run through that list after we get through all the workshops. So that, that's a really good reminder because I think, uh, I think we did it last year. I mean, we create this list as we go through the budget process and then we're able to kind of go back and look at it because if we largely debated each item as we were going, we'd be in this process for a significant amount of time. So no counselor should ever hesitate to say, I'd like that on the list and it could be a budget increase or a budget reduction that you're thinking, but it just puts it there for further discussion. So thank you, Heather, for bringing that up. And I also will add that tomorrow morning, the budget will be found under the city's website. There are also hard copies are available at the library and in the city clerk's office. From the FY20 approved budget, it's a 3.8% increase. Any other uh, questions, comments from the council? Councilor Gelinas, you're muted. I, I don't know why I can't raise my hand. I, I can't find that feature. I apologize for uh, whatever reason it's not popping up for me, but um, Director Hunter, did I hear you say that there were certain items from the LCIP that have been shifted over already? That's correct. Yeah. And. Do we know what are those going to be highlighted for us? We have an idea of what where those shifts have occurred because I just was as, as you were talking through, I didn't want to interrupt, but I was wondering, is that a separate list for us to look at or? Yes, if you yeah. turn to page 37 in your budget book. Yeah, got it right here. I'm sorry, 36. Um, yeah. You will see that under the bottom, it says from LCIP. Okay, good, good, good. Thank you. Those are the projects that we moved over. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Other questions or comments from the council? Keep going, Council Gelinas, if you'd like. I just found the raise hand. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> <I'm good. laughs> you want to test it or something? Or no? Okay. 
Uh, so there's going to be plenty of opportunity. One, I'm sure councilors have, may not have had an opportunity to kind of look through their entire budget pack, uh, book, but as we all know, we have uh, a dozen or so meetings ahead of us where uh, as we work through this process, I'm sure many questions and suggestions will come up. So not having any, any questions this evening is not uh, a big concern because you'll develop them. Councilor Khalid? Um, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Two questions. Um, one, for the 12 positions that will be reinstated that were frozen, is it under the new program service that, that ex no, it's not? Okay. No, um, the direction that we were given last year when the budget was approved was to freeze those positions, those vacant positions. So those were unfrozen in the base budget. So you really have two different lists. You have those 12 that we've added back, plus you have the new program and service positions that are what, eight, about eight um, full-time positions. Um, I forgot my other question, but I'm sure I'll remember it. Thank you. And just to clarify, uh, in reference to Council Khalid's question, those 12 positions are still currently vacant Yes, in some way, shape, or form, yes. We had one retiree that elect, or a person that was going to retire that didn't retire, so we kind of grabbed another position at that point in time, but we have them all identified, yes. All right, so my list, I only, you know, I just want to see currently vacant positions that have not been filled. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we can do that. And Mr. Mayor, if I could... Um, Thursday night is our first departmental workshop that begins at six o'clock. Um, that, at that point, we will review the personal services and fringe benefits, the capital outlay list, and then kind of the public works suite, which includes all of the parking, as well as um, the actual public works divisions that evening. Okay, thank you. Uh... Any other questions or comments from the council? Okay, seeing none, I just want to open it up to the public uh, if they may have questions. I think a good amount of folks are employees of either the city or the school, but uh, okay, I'm not seeing any hands raised. All right, one last time back to the council. All right. Uh, Thank you. Oh, here we go. Council of the Joy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I know we've heard this every year. However, I do believe that the proposed tax rate is too large. And I'm going to be an individual that will be working to lower uh, to a uh, better rate than what is proposed. So those are my concerns. I think we're going to have to work extremely hard uh, to try to get it down to 29% or somewhere around there. So thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I'll, I'll throw out one more quick thing. Uh, as we work through this budget process, I would encourage counselors to uh, think about our goals that we developed. Uh, and if we could try to focus budget items that support the goals of the council, one of them was, you know, one of the priorities was economic development. Uh, uh, so I just think that's a, I think that's always a good philosophy as we deal with the budget uh, and work through it. But again, that's just one person's opinion, I'm sure. There are seven other opinions sitting in the room as well. So I would encourage other people to come to think of ideas as we move through this process. All right, uh, not seeing any further questions. Uh, our regular meeting starts at seven o'clock. And uh, so I think if everybody can, oh, Councillor Clement. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I've listened to what my colleague from Ward 4 has just had to say, and I've got to concur. If we're going to have an increase of this magnitude, I'm going to have to have some convincing. Uh, I'm not saying that it wouldn't be possible, but uh, 
we're coming off what has been a bad year for our constituents, the taxpayers of the city. Uh, I think any increase of this magnitude is going to have to have some very significant uh, backup before I could uh, see myself going for it. Like I say, I may go there, but uh, just a caution that do your due diligence, people, because I, uh, I'm one of seven votes, but I think you're going to need five before it's over. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, with that said, uh, seeing no other comments, uh, we'll return. So if everybody could just uh, take their video down, make sure they're muted uh, and you can leave everything up and running and we'll see each other back here in just over 15 minutes.
Okay, everybody, uh, welcome back. Uh, so just a quick reminder for attendees, uh, any public comments on any items apparent on the agenda may be sent to public comment at lewistonmain.gov prior to or during this meeting and all comments received will be forwarded to the city councilors. Uh, members of the public who are logged into the meeting online can make a comment when invited to do so by using the raise hand button, which is usually found in the lower center of the screen. Uh, with that said, uh, the first item is an update from uh, city administration on any actions regarding COVID-19. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a couple of things. Um, vaccine, the mass vaccine um, clinic uh, in, um, in Auburn opens tomorrow. Um, several um, other opportunities like B Street Clinic continue. Um, city staff and some of the health um, organizations continue to look for other mechanisms to deliver vaccine, particularly to the underserved. So um, that's really the status of the vaccines as it is today. Um, City Hall, um, we continue with our normal hygiene of uh, six feet and masks for both uh, staff and um, people that come in. Um, a couple other new, we're trying to assess the new governor's opening guidelines. Um, on March 5th, she opened up um, travel to New England states without quarantine. On March 26th, indoor and outdoor gatherings have changed and we're trying to assess um, how that might um, allow us to uh, serve the public a little better at City Hall and our other public buildings. May 1st, um, travel will open up to all states um, without quarantine. And then May 24th is a even broader opening of capacities and buildings. And we're trying to assess again how that um, allows us to serve the public better. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll now entertain a uh, motion to accept the minutes of March 9th, 2021. So moved. Second. Okay, moved by Councilor Khalid, seconded by Councilor Jensen. Call the roll, please. Councilor from Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. And Ward 6? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 6 to 0. Okay, thank you. It's a public comment period. Any member of the public uh, may make comments regarding issues pertaining to Lewiston City Government uh, on items that are not on the agenda. Is there anyone from the public that would like to make a comment to the council? Okay, we have one resident so far, Mr. Bloom, if we could bring him in. Good evening, uh, Mr. Bloom, if you could just unmute your mic. Good Mayor. Good evening, sir. Can you guys hear me okay? We can, thank you very much, and please go ahead. Okay, uh, I have a thing to read, one moment. Okay. Okay. Nope. Uh, Mayor Kyer, city council members and city employees, thank you for your time and for your work. Before I start, I just wanna say that I'm gonna probably say some negative stuff, uh, but I have worked with good people throughout the city government. And I know that we're all doing our best with what we have. And I know that these are trying times. I'm hoping to just shed some light on some of the things that I've been dealing with here a resident and landlord in the city. Um, the theme of what I have to say is basically, you know, dirtiness and difficulty doing business. Um, and uh, that to get anywhere, I kind of feel like I have to freak out and call a bunch of people and call the police and my lawyers to, to solve problems that seem like they should be more solvable. Uh, I began a complaint in early January about a couple of apartments living next door uh, leaving dog feces to pile up on their porches, which are five feet from my tenant's windows. Months later, the pile of feces is still there, sometimes kicked off onto my property where I walk. Uh, seems like this is a health code issue and causes me and my tenants to smell it. Not acceptable. 
it's not really acceptable and 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 and, and we need to fix that and um I'm told also that they have been ignoring fines and notices. I don't know what the process really is behind the scenes, but it seems like it could go a little faster when it is a humongous pile of ignored dog bodies. Um, after being told that this is a civil matter by code at one point, I called the police and it was kind of blown off. It's not a big deal by the control officer when one apartment dumped all the feces onto my land. Complained again and insisted they come out. They finally did and they removed the feces, but here we are two months later and I still pretty much have the same problem. Um, I also went looking for a phone number and I couldn't find it because we don't have a rental registry going yet, which I thought was supposed to be there. That's very frustrating to not be able to find a phone number of this owner. Um, I thought we had solved that problem. Uh, and last week I got a nasty trash letter from the city saying that if I messed up my payment at the end of this COVID year from something that the city council had passed to allow payments, which was really great. Thank you very much. Um, if I messed up my payment, I'll be charged $100 and I won't get my trash picked up till July of 2022. That letter felt like it was from the mob and I, I'm considering a private trash company if that's how somebody's going to speak to me. Um, during the last couple months, I've tried to come to a couple city council meetings, but I could not because the link that I kept finding was broken. I often find broken links when I on, on the site when I'm trying to like find details about things to hear about. Um, uh, a few months back, uh, I was told uh, somewhere along the line that it's better down here than it was. Um, when I complained about trash and disarray and whatnot. And, and, and I just want to say that if that's really true and where we're at, then the bar is too low. Um, it's really, you know, messed up down here. I'm sure it was worse at some point, but the bar needs to raise. Um, and someone was shot here in October at my doorstep in front of my house. I hear cleaner neighborhoods don't have as many killers. And I really want a cleaner neighborhood and it's going to take us all to do our part. Uh, there's obviously a lot of people involved. You know, I'll pick up trash. I'll send lawyers after problematic properties that affect my property and tenants. And I'll be back to let you know how things are going in the future. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, sir. Are there any other members of the uh, public that would like to make a con comment? If we, uh, if we could, uh, city administrator, Dote, could, uh, could somebody just follow up with Mr. Bloom? Some of his audio wasn't the greatest. Uh, so I, you know, although I think we got a clear understanding of his message uh, to the council, but it would probably be good to follow up just to make sure that if there's anything that we can uh, do to assist with him connecting with the right folks. We certainly will. That was a note I took as well uh, based on the audio, but also um, lots of items that he covered there. We want to make sure we follow through. So thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, and so seeing no, nothing further, I'll close the public comment period. Councilor Clement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Dote, if you would get contact information for Mr. Bloom, uh, I think I might be able to assist him in some of his uh, problems. That was what I did at the last uh, full-time position. And uh, there are some remedies available to him that he could uh, seek some assistance from, but I'd be happy to talk with him about it. I just don't have a point of a contact. Thank you. Certainly, we can get you that. Okay, Madam Clerk, uh, the roll. Sure. Um, uh, the I'm sorry, the voting roll or yes. taking attendance. Sorry. Okay. Um, all roll call votes for this meeting will begin with the Council of Ward Seven. And uh, now that you mentioned it, uh, if we could take attendance by the roll, that would be good. Sure. Council from Ward 1? Present. Ward 2? Here. Uh, we'll note for the record that Ward 3 has an excused absence this meeting, although uh, she might be able to join us later on. Uh, Ward 4? Present. Ward 5? Present. Ward 6? Present. And Ward 7? Present. Also present, Mr. Mayor, for this meeting is uh, City Administrator Dennis Dote, Deputy City Administrator Dale Dowdy, 
Heather Hunter, the finance director, and myself as city clerk. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And with the absence of the Ward 3 counselor, uh, the mayor will take the opportunity to break any ties between the council, but other otherwise than that, I won't be voting. Uh, with that said, agenda item number one, please. Item number one, public hearing on the renewal application for a special amusement permit for live entertainment for the Baxter Brew Pub LLC, 120 Mill Street. Requested action to grant a special amusement permit for live entertainment to Baxter Brew Pub LLC, 120 Mill Street. So moved. So moved. Second. Okay, moved by Councilor LaJoy, seconded by uh, Councilor Jensen. Uh, and I'll open up the public hearing. Is there anyone from the public that would have comments in reference to uh, a special amusement permit? Okay, seeing none, I'll uh, close the public hearing. Any uh, questions or comments from the council? Seeing none, call the roll, please. Council from Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Ward four? Yes. Ward five? Yes. And ward six? Yes. Motion passed by vote of six to zero. Okay, thank you. Agenda item number two, please. Item number two, public hearing and first passage to rezone the property at 186 Oak Street. Requested action to approve first passage to amend the land use code and zoning map for a zone change request from community business to neighborhood conservation B for the property located at 186 Oak Street and to continue the public hearing for final passage to the next regularly scheduled city council meeting. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, I'll open the uh, public hearing, but at the same time, are we gonna bring staff in on this? Yes, we are. Dave Hedegar is on his way. Right, and um, Ms. Strout is also here present. All right, thank you. And welcome Ms. Strout to the city council meeting. Uh, if we could, uh, we'll have Dave just do a brief update to the council and presentation. Sure, thank you. Um, so the Strouts were interested in putting a new garage on their property. Their property is on Oak Street. It's zoned community <laughs> business. The setbacks are 20 feet out there. Strouts have a lot that's 50 by 100, and it just doesn't work to put a um, garage on a property with such big setbacks given the lot size. When you look at the zoning map, and um, I'm realizing now when you have a black and white copy, it's probably not as easy to see, but <clears throat> the opposite side of Oak Street from her is zoned neighborhood conservation B. That is a zoning district that has five foot setbacks. It's very similar in um, its development scheme over there with multifamilies and residential uses. Uh, right up the block from her on the si same side of the road is zoned NCB. However, her side of Oak Street is not. Um, in order to accommodate um, Ms. Strout and, and what she's looking to do out there, um, she asked about rezoning the property. Um, we discussed that. We thought that was a reasonable request. In fact, we think it's something that's probably worth exploring for the rest of that area out there that's currently zoned CB. Um, there's a main street side of it that is zoned commercially and that probably makes sense but even with the lot sizes out there that probably doesn't lend itself well to any redevelopment of those lots along the main street corridor and certainly on the oak street corridor where that probably should be residential it doesn't allow things like what um, Ms. Stroud is looking to do so the planning board considered um, her request she petitioned the planning board for a rezoning of her property um, it was unanimous approval. You guys have a copy of that action form there. We actually suggested to the board and they agreed as well um, to initiate a larger change there that we imagine we'll be probably working on in the next three to six months where we would explore um, the rezoning of that, of that area to a greater extent. Um, Strout's here if she has anything she wants to add or if we have any questions. All right, thank you. Ms. Strout, would you like to add anything? Um, I don't. I just um, wanted to reiterate that I don't think that the zone that we're in right now, it makes sense. Um, you know, we certainly are a residential neighborhood, not a commercial, uh, not a commercial neighborhood. So um, I was kind of surprised when I went to get my permit um, to build and found out that we were commercial. So that's kind of how this whole thing started. And I just hope that you guys vote in my favor. That's all. all. Right. Thank you. Uh, Dave, was, were there any fees 
that were assessed to the Strouts to bring this, to present this to the planning board? There was. When you do a rezoning, it costs seven hundred dollars. So, so I just I noticed in our packet that uh, that even staff states that that zone being a CB zone uh, was inappropriate. Could you just shed some light on that? Because I I realize there are ways that like a counselor could have brought this forward so there would have been no fees, or staff could have brought it forward so there would have been no fees. And I, I'm concerned that we're charging a significant fee for something that should have never been that way. But before I get, get to that place, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Yeah, sure. So um, you're right about how uh, amendments are initiated, whether it's a text amendment, map amendments, happens one of three ways. Um, citizen petition, which is what um, the Strouts did, initiated by the planning board, initiated by city council. Usually if it's the planning board, they either initiate it on their own or we ask them to initiate it. That's what we've done here with the larger rezoning. Um, certainly there's been times where we've come to the council before and you've had a, a feeling from a presentation that, hey, you wanna see a change happen and you've initiated it. In this case, we asked the Strouts to initiate it um, by collecting in the necessary 10 signatures um, to get the process going there. Um, as far as you know, our support and whether or not um, this is appropriate rezoning, um, or excuse me, not an appropriate rezoning, but is, is the zoning appropriate for that neighborhood out there? Um, honestly, it, it really wasn't on our radar screen. I mean, we've talked about it. We have a list of things that we, we talk about regularly that, geez, if we had some time, we should pursue this. Um, but when Sonia brought it to our attention, it's like, hey, great, we have a real thing in front of us now. Let's piggyback on that. If the planning board and the council think there's value in doing that, we'll pursue it now. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll bump it up and we'll explore doing those changes. So that's where we are at this point. Um, you folks may recall from the last meeting we had, the workshop, where we talked about some fee schedule changes. Um, of that $700, $200 of that is collected, excuse me, 200 or 300. I can confirm that, but in either event, either two to $300 of that is collected in effort to offset the legal costs. Um, legal costs being the legal ad in the, in the paper. And these ads tend to cost us more too because we have to put a copy of the map in with the legal ad as well. So it's not just text, but there's an image with it as well. Okay. All right, uh, thank you. Any, uh, any questions or comments from the council? Councilor Clement? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I guess I would pose this to Mr. Hedegar. Uh, the $200 that's gone, I assume, to the Sun Journal for legal ads, two to $300. Any reason why we can't uh, rebate the remainder of that $700 fee? That seems to me to be a little excessive under the circumstances. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, there's um, certainly if that's the direction that the council wants to go into, we, we can entertain that. Um, you know, we don't typically, um, I can tell you what we've done in the past with other proposals um, where we may have initiated something on behalf of someone else is that we've at least to um, similar, maybe asked them to cover whatever the legal fees would be. So that two or $300 have them comp pay for that. And then we would, you know, defer or waive the, the remaining half. So. Um, that's something we could we could entertain for Sonia. It's not a problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Jensen. Thank you, Mayor Kerr. Um, was the uh, legal ad that was paid, is that something required by statute or is that something we just required by the city? So that actually is one of the ones that is required by statute. Um, I think um, Dennis Dote sent you folks um, an email to that effect from last time where there are certain things where we actually have to run a legal ad and one of them is um, zoning amendments. So per statute, we have to put that in the paper so many days in advance. Okay, makes sense. Um, yeah, just for the public's uh, record, I, I am very much supportive of looking at the city level of what we can do for posting those kind of ads and if we can um, have a cheap, like a less expensive way of doing so instead of putting a few hundred dollars on our residents, if we can find a, a less expensive a digital way of doing that. To me, that makes a lot of sense and it's worth having that conversation. Maybe when we have that conversation, we realize it's probably not the best idea, but we need to have that conversation. So I really hope that we uh, we have that. Um, 
And um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree with uh, Councillor uh, Clement's comments about, I mean, anything that we could refund to the Strouds, I'd definitely be in favor of doing so. Um, just given that, you know, kind of put the onus on them to initiate the process when I, I guess we could have ourselves as counselors. Um, so I guess I'm not quite sure what we'd have to do for that, but I'm in favor of that and I'll leave it there. Yeah, I, so just quickly, I, I would recommend, you know, staff look at it and we should cover our costs. I, I, I agree with, uh, and, and thank you for bringing that up, Director Hediger, that there is true cost. Uh, but but I would, uh, I would look to see once we cover those costs, if we're able to, and I would lead that discussion between you and the city administrator, of course. Uh, Councilor Gelinas. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just would piggyback on what you just said. I mean, I, I was going to say that I'm in support of this, Mrs. Stroud. I think um, it's important that you've brought this forward, and I think we do need to cover costs. But the other fees, I mean, if this was a debatable property, this was like, well, maybe it really might be commercial. Maybe it's really not residential. Maybe, but clearly uh, the, you, as well as even some of the city staff have said that it's, it's you know, it is pretty residential. So um, yeah, thanks for bringing this forward. I definitely support your request. Okay, thank you. Councilor Khalid, I saw your hand up. Are you all set? Um, yeah, I was just going to say what, you know, the rest of the counselors have already said, um, but also to re reiterate that we should look into rezoning that area to, um, to the neighborhood. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Clement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just for purposes of clarity, I too agree that we should cover our costs in this particular instance. And I trust that Mr. Hediger and Mr. Dote will do the right thing in this particular instance and and take care of our, our taxpayers. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilor Jensen. Thank you, Mayor Kerr. Um, I'll say once again, I guess I'd uh, concur exactly what Councilor Clement just said, and I move first passage. Second. Okay, uh, moved by Councilor Jensen, seconded by Councilor Clement. Um, we still have a public hearing. Is there any members of the public that would like to comment? Okay, seeing none, I'll close the uh, public hearing. Uh, any final thoughts or questions from counselors? Seeing none, call the roll, please. Counselor from Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. And Ward 6? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 6 to 0. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Director Hediger, and thank you very much, Ms. Stroh. And we'll have a second reading in probably the next meeting. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Agenda item number three, please. Item number three, order authorizing the acquisition of a utility easement for a new storm drain pipe existing storm drain pipe and an existing sewer main at 425 Lisbon Street. Requested action to approve the order authorizing the acquisition of a utility easement for a new storm drain, storm drain pipe, existing storm drain pipe, and an existing sewer main at 425 Lisbon Street. Mr. Mayor, we're bringing Mary, a uh, director Brenchik. Okay, thank you. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Okay. Okay, moved by Councilor Gelinas. I believe that was seconded by Councilor Jensen. Okay, uh, with that, uh, Director, if you could, if you have a brief presentation. This is just a, a, a tough area where we're tackling one of those short pieces that need to be separated from the stormwater and the sewer. Um, so glad to see some of these tough ones tackled and, and just taken care of. Again, that's a small alley. It's a tough area to get into. I'm glad to get this piece done. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments from the council? To the public? Back to the council. Call the roll, please. Councilor from Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Ward 4? Councilor yes. Ward 4, thank you. Ward 5? Yes. And Ward 6? Yes. 
Thank you. Motion passed by vote of six to zero. Okay, thank you. Agenda item number four, please. Item number four, order authorizing the city administrator to execute an agreement with Maine Department of Transportation to complete pedestrian safety improvements at the Five Corners area of Central Avenue. Requested action to approve the order authorizing the city administrator to execute an agreement with Maine Department of Transportation to complete pedestrian safety improvements at the Five Corners area of Central Avenue. So move. Second, Mr. Second. Okay, moved by Councilor Jensen, seconded by Councilor Clement. And I, Marianne, I believe you're probably presenting on this as well. Thank you. Go ahead. This is kind of a unique uh, situation where we could put an educational program in with some infrastructure and including, you know, working with the middle school students, which is, you know, I come from a teaching background. So very exciting to get them involved with how do we teach people how to use the walk lights? What could we do better here? And what are some of the walking areas around the middle school? Not just this five corners area, but where else are they going? So it's kind of a STEM project. We're excited to do it through the rec division um, in our leadership and training program. So there's a lot of different check marks in this and we're just excited that the State Department of Transportation let us put an educational program into this. So um, it's very unique. We're excited to work with the middle school students. All right, thank you. Uh, questions or comments from the council? Councilor Jensen. Thank you, Mayor Kerr. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, a lot of our middle school students do walk to the middle school um, and they do use that intersection from multiple different areas. I usually see them coming when I'm you know, on my way to work. Um, so this is going to be a really cool project and I'm, I'm pretty excited to see it move forward. So thank you, Ms. Brinchett. Okay. Any other questions or comments from the council to the public? Back to the council. Call the roll, please. Councilor from Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. And Ward 6? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 6 to 0. Okay, thank you, Mary Ann. Uh, gender item number 5, please. Item number five, order authorizing the city administrator to execute a first amended and restated parking agreement with Bates Mill LLC and Platts Associates. Requested action to approve the order authorizing the city administrator to execute a first amended and restated parking agreement with Bates Mill LLC and Platts Associates. So moved. So moved. Okay, moved by Councilor Gelinas, seconded by Councilor LaJoy. And I believe you. Director Jeffers and Misty Parker will be coming in. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, Council, thank you so much. Um, before you tonight is a uh, Restated parking agreement with uh, Bates Mill LLC and Platts Associates. Um, what the revised parking agreement looks at is um, revising the 2004 original agreement we have um, between the Bates Mill complex and the city to support the redevelopment of the complex except for Mill 5. Um, the original agreement in 2004 um, laid out <clears throat> uh, very specific requirements that as development occurred, how parking would be built to um, accommodate that parking as well as new spaces. Um, it also had a variety of different uh, security agreements to ensure that um, the parking uh, that was required for the mill would be um, agreed to. The city and uh, Bates Mill LLC, uh, specifically Tom Platts, have been working uh, towards this um, over the years. And before us tonight is a number of changes. This has come about uh, because, um, as you're aware, Tom Platts has had an option on Bates Mill number five, and he approached the city um, regarding an extension of that option. Um, as part of that discussion, um, we proposed uh, revisiting the parking agreement to make some adjustments, acknowledging that a number of things have changed. Um, and so this is one of the factors that we have um, renegotiated. 
So I'm just going to run through some of the highlights of those changes that are before you tonight. Um, what's not covered in the parking agreement, we will discuss when the option agreement um, comes up in the next agenda item. So the original agreement uh, required a, the city to provide a total of 2,040 spaces. This new agreement is actually lowering that number to 1,850 spaces. It also acknowledges by both parties that 840 spaces have been provided by the city already, leaving the city to provide 880 new spaces um, as the rest of Mills 1 and Mills 2 are redeveloped. Um, part of this also, this agreement change also moves for in previous year under the old agreement, the um, parking demand notice from the developer um, triggered uh, when the city would have to provide the new spaces. So essentially under the old agreement, as they redeveloped space, new space in one of the mills, um, they would initiate a parking demand notice um, for, for the city to provide X number of new parking spaces based on the square footage of what was being redeveloped. Uh, under the new agreement, um, these parking demand notices will be um, when initiated, instead of the city having to um, provide the spaces based on square footage, they'll actually um, be looking at the utilization of the garages in the area so that um, if all the garages and parking that's provided to the mill is um, under 85% utilization, um, we don't have to build. Um, but if there is um, utilization over 85%, meaning that majority of the parking is being utilized, then the demand is there and we would then need to provide those spaces. So this ensures that we are only building what, we, what is absolutely needed um, to support that space. Additionally, there is a bond requirement as part of the agreement in the 2004 agreement. Um, this was a guarantee bond in the amount of a little over $4 million to secure um, those uh, requirements that the city had to provide. Uh, this agreement lowers that amount to just over $2 million. And additionally, um, Bates Mill LLC, which is not in the parking agreement, but part of this negotiation, um, they have agreed to take the steam plant. This was part of the original um, discussions um, when the Bates Mill was being redeveloped. Um, we had said that you know, both parties had agreed in the future at some point, um, the city would convey the steam plant over to Bates Mill LLC. Um, it had always been discussed that this may happen around the time that Mill 5 is conveyed to Bates Mill LLC. Um, however, um, there's really no reason that the city holds on to it anymore. And it's been sort of in a joint partnership because it does provide heat for the Bates Mill complex, but it's owned by the city that this should be uh, sped up and um, just conveyed as soon as possible. The need to go through our own property disposition uh, procedures. Um, so it is something that, um, you know, Tom Platts has agreed to um, when, you know, in the near future, the city is, can convey this to him. So that covers the majority of the changes that are before you in regards to this parking amendment. Um, you know, it was reviewed by both parties and discuss to um, a lot of extent and really brings it to an agreement where we, um, we can still continue to support the redevelopment of Bates Mill complex, as well as, um, you know, do so in a manner that works for the city and um, our capacity. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director Jeffers, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, uh, Misty's really done a great job with this. She and I had started negotiating with Tom a year or so back, and she really picked up the reins and took this to the goal line uh, just over the last several months. I think uh, it's been some tough, tough sledding, but I think she's done a really nice job structuring an agreement that uh, improves the city's position and uh, still works for, for Mr. Platt. 
All right. I, I'd just like to acknowledge for a decade now, what we've been talking about, we should really try to renegotiate that parking agreement. Uh, I think it's talked about almost every year. So a uh, really nice job from your department uh, getting us to that, that place. Uh, questions or comments from the council? Okay, seeing none to the public. <clears throat> Back to the council. Councilor Clement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Jeffers, Ms. Parker, good job. I, I concur with what has been presented to us. I know it's been some tough sledding and I probably have been a part of that tough sledding, but I'm very happy to see what's presented to us tonight. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Councilor Khalid. Um, I just, I just wanna um, thank the staff, Lincoln and um, Misty for their great work and um, for Tom for his, his great partnership. Mm. Thank, you. thank you for saying that. All right, any other questions or comments from the council? All right, I can't remember if I went to the public already, but we're going to, I did? Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, seeing no uh, questions or comments, call the roll, please. Councilor from Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. And Ward 6? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 6 to 0. Okay, thank you. Agenda item number 6, please. Item number six, order authorizing the city administrator to execute a final option agreement, which if exercised will result in the conveyance of Bates Mill number five, the weave shed to Bates Mill LLC. Requested action to approve the order authorizing the city administrator to execute a final option agreement, which if exercised will result in the conveyance of Bates Mill number five, the weave shed to Bates Mill LLC. So moved. Second. Okay, moved by Councillor Khalid, seconded by Councillor Clement, uh, and whichever staff member is going to present. Yeah, uh, yeah, again, Misty's been in the thick of it on the legal documents, but to provide a little background on this, uh, this is really a renewal of an option. Uh, I think it's the third time. Uh, is it the fourth time we're renewing it? Um, what complicated this a little bit is the Brownfield grant, which the city received, which is about a half a million dollars. We are working actively to start uh, taking actions on that. Actually, the next, towards the end of the month, on uh, March 30th, there will be a public hearing sort of laying out, here's the strategies that we'll use to address uh, the environmental issues in the building. Uh, so you'll get to hear a lot more detail on that. But uh, really, the city needs to maintain its ownership for the term that we have that Brownfield grant. Uh, <clears throat> so Tom will be able to concurrently be working on all of his stuff to uh, try to attract tenants to the building and design and all those things, but we really couldn't convey this until midsummer next summer at the very earliest. And so this really gives Tom, and from conversations we've had, it really gives him the time and flexibility to, you know, the projects of this scale, uh, typically this is a 350,000 square foot building and before it's bankable, you need to have about half of it leased. Uh, so you need tenant commitments. And Tom has been working very hard for the whole time he's had it under uh, option, has had some great momentum only to have, lose a tenant. And so it's been back and forth, but uh, that's sort of the background. Misty has been in the thick of, of really getting this uh, legal document um, crafted. And with that, I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet. And if Misty wants to add anything to it. Yeah, just a quick summary of um, what's included in the option before you. It provides, as Lincoln had said, that additional time for the city to complete the brownfields cleanup. Additionally, um, there, there will be no action um, by Tom Platts on the parking demand notice that was issued in November 2019. Um, the, it includes some milestones over the five years to just demonstrate progress. Um, on the mill redevelopment. And as part of that, you know, uh, Tom Platt has agreed to um, provide regular updates to the council on their pro on his progress. Um, so that, that's about it. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions or comments from the council? Okay, seeing none to the public. And 
Back to the council. Councilor Clement. Again, kudos to economic development for their performance on this particular issue. I know this has been a, a thorn in many people's side for a long time. I think they've done a good job. And hopefully this time we can bring this whole thing to fruition. I thank you. Thank you, Councilor Jensen. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mayor Kerr. Um, I just wanted to, um, I guess, point out that I, I disagree with it being a final option. I also disagree with some of the benchmarks being put in place. I don't think development hasn't happened in the city in the level that we wanted to, not because um, of fault of developers or business people in the city, but because we don't have the conditions yet in the city to foster that kind of growth. And that those conditions are gonna happen when we in the council and the city as a whole community can create that. And so I know Lewiston has been lagging behind other communities, but I guess I just disagree with some of the, the metrics that we're looking for, some of the benchmarks here, and also the final option. Um, I just think it's, we're getting closer to a, a, the conditions in which this could actually take place and happen and be developed. Um, so I, I don't necessarily agree with everything that's in the option here. So I don't want a negative vote here to imply that I disagree with it entirely. Um, my issues here are just in the final aspect of it and um, some of the benchmarks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments from the council? Okay, uh, seeing none, call the roll. Councilor from Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? No. And Ward 6? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 5 to 1. Okay, thank you. Agenda item number seven, please. Item number seven, resolve authorizing a second release of the pandemic emergency small business loan program. Requested action to approve the resolve authorizing a second release of the pandemic emergency small business loan program. Move for passage. Okay, moved by Councillor Clement, seconded by Councillor Jensen. Mm -hmm. and we will have Heidi McCarthy and Misty Packer again. Okay, if we could have a brief presentation. This has been workshop, I think, uh, recently. Heidi, do you want to run us through? Or... Uh, I did workshop it last week, so I won't um, take too much of your time. Um, this is essentially the second release of a program that the city council approved last June. Um, this program ended in July um, after reaching out to businesses um, to see what barriers may have been associated with the program. Um, we're suggesting some changes, including uh, upping the employee limit and um, the sales uh, uh, limit to 100 employees and, and $6 million. We're also suggesting that um, instead of having a cutoff date for application, um, there is a rolling application um, available. Um, this program would have approximately $91,320 um, available in it. Uh, if both this program and the um, next agenda item are approved, um, that would uh, be a total of $139,320. One of the changes um, that you'll see this week um, also here is that um, due to council feedback, um, we put in a provision that um, we will monitor interest in each of the programs if both approved and um, come back to the council if um, to, to consider any uh, reallocation of funding if necessary. All right, thank you. Uh, questions or Misty, was there anything you wanted to add or was that it? That's it. Um, it's a great resource for businesses that are having trouble accessing other funds. And a big thank you to Heidi for a lot of the work she did on this and the landlord program, putting everything together, you know, doing the outreach with staff and businesses to make sure that these um, programs are. Okay, thank you. Councilor Khalid. Um, Heidi, can you remind me if nonprofits are included in this? Yes, this is for both nonprofit and for profit businesses. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you. Council of Gelinas. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Heidi, I just wanted to thank you and your colleagues for you know the work that you did on this, but specifically um, the work that you did before this um, 
you know, second release, the work that you did just identifying barriers and really looking to make this more accessible to the business community. So thank you for that. Hey, thank you for mentioning that because I, I would assume the entire council feels that way as well. Uh, any other questions or comments from the council? Seeing none to the public. Back to the council. Call the roll, please. Councilor from Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. And Ward 6? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 6 to 0. Okay, thank you. Agenda item number 8, please. Item number 8, resolve establishing the Residential Landlord Forgivable Loan Program. Requested action to approve the resolve establishing the Residential Landlord Forgivable Loan Program. So move. Second. Second. Moved by Councilor LaJoy, seconded by Councilor Clement. Uh, Heidi, are you gonna take the lead on this one? All right, thank you. Yes. Uh, so this, um, this program came from a need um, that landlords had because they were unable, un, uh, eligible for, ineligible for a lot of the other funding sources that um, other businesses were eligible for. Um, also, landlords um, don't have the same opportunities to um, adjust their business models um, uh, if they're seeing uh, revenue losses due to COVID. And so this would be a forgivable loan program um, it would be approximately 48, there would be approximately $48,000 available. Um, there would be a three-year term. The loan would be forgivable after two years. In order to be forgiven, um, landlords would need to, for the two years, accept general assistance vouchers, um, be, uh, remain code compliant, remain in the rental registration database and update um, as necessary, and keep ownership of the property. It can be used for operating expenses and um, with council feedback from last time, um, we changed the date from uh, expenses incurred prior to November 2020 to expenses, um, any expenses after March 15th, 2020 will be eligible. All right, thank you. And since the uh, workshop, Heidi, has have you seen any interest from landlords as of yet? Uh, we've had two reach out to ask questions about um, about guidelines and when it would be available. All right, thank you. Uh, questions or comments from the council? Okay, seeing none to the public. Okay, we have one uh, member of the public wishing to speak. Hello, Amy. Thank you very much for joining the uh, city council meeting and you're all set to go. Hi guys, thank you so much. This has been a great meeting and really appreciate all the programs that you're discussing tonight. Um, this landlord program is really, really needed. And I just wanna reiterate um, the importance of keeping the requirements flexible uh, because the devil is in the details on this stuff and it's kind of, it's, everything is so muddled together in terms of you know, this is due to COVID, that's due to something else. And so I just wanna go on record saying, um, Heidi and Misty have been great listening um, to concerns and putting together the program. Um, but I think like any program like this, we wanna just remain flexible as we roll it out. And I hope it, uh, that a lot of people can take advantage of it and hang on to these, these properties and continue to do well by them. Thanks. All right, thank you. Uh... Seeing no further comments in the public, uh, I'll bring it back to the council. Seeing, seeing no, nothing further, call the roll, please. Councilor from Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Councilor from Ward 1? Yes. Thank you. Ward 2? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. And Ward 6? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 6 to 0. Okay, thank you. Agenda item number 9, please. Item number 9, adopting the Lewiston Equity Statement as the Equity Statement for the City of Lewiston. Requested action to approve the order adopting the Lewiston Equity Statement as Equity Statement for the City of Lewiston. So moved. 
Okay, folks, we need a second. Second. Okay, moved by Councilor Jensen, seconded by Councilor Khalid. Uh, and which staff member? Okay, thank you, City Administrator Delta. Uh, evening, Mayor, City Councilors. Uh, this item is, um, is the equity statement that's been delivered by the City Spirit uh, Council. City Spirit Council was formed uh, two plus years ago. Um, and have been working as a collaboration between city staff or city city representation, I should say, uh, school representation and members of the community um, on addressing uh, issues around equity uh, throughout the city of Lewiston and developing, uh, you know, uh, plans and, and, and ways to address that. One of the first tasks that they uh, are delivering to us and we workshop last uh, council meeting on the second is a city equity statement and that is being presented this evening as it was presented at the workshop with, with no changes. Okay, thank you. Questions or comments from the council? Councilor Clement. I have a couple of questions, Mr. Mayor, and then I have a comment. Uh, first of all, how did this actually come about? So I, I might be able to add a little something here. I think, uh, so City Spirit began with the chief and I'll let, uh, it, with the chief uh, making contact with the DOJ and I'll let uh, Dennis uh, elaborate more on that. But uh, I think a, a couple of years ago, an equity statement was being spoken about at the school and uh, it was then brought forth that possibly the city and school should jointly work on an equity statement. Uh, Dennis, yeah. I, I believe that's accurate, accurate mayor, um, you know, an accurate summary um, of how that came, to, came to, to be today. There's a cost associated with this or a funding of a grant in the amount of $45,000, I believe. These were funds from DOJ. So what I would ask is I'm gonna actually ask, um, we do have uh, Fatuma Hussein's in the audience who uh, may be able to speak to some of these uh, questions a little easier. Um, we can either uh, ask to bring her in or we could look to bring in um, Chief O'Malley, but I believe one of those two would be the, uh, the better to speak to these questions. Good evening, Fatuma. Good evening, Mayor. Thank you. you. Yeah, you're welcome. And did you hear the question from Councillor Clement? Yes, and Councillor Clement, the uh, funding is coming from Sewell Foundation. Um, so it's um, it's funding outside uh, city funding. And in fact, Sewell Foundation does have a commitment around a number of different issues around um, housing development, um, food systems, a number of different issues, including equity that is going to be dedicating a five-year commitment in driving some of this work. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mayor, if I might, I have a comment. Okay. I have read, reread this proposed statement over and over. I cannot resolve the basic premise that in its present form, it asks us to approve or sanction an illegal situation. I find no fault with the basic premise that we should promote, encourage, and require equality and the treatment of all others, provided this occurs according to the rule of law. In the fourth paragraph, final sentence of the proposed equity statement, it says we will create an environment where everyone is to be treated the same, regardless of several categories, including immigration status. I would remind everyone that there are four types of immigration status. In the United States, one of those status types is undocumented or illegal. The four types are United States citizen, which most of us I believe are. The second type would be a permanent or conditional legal resident. A conditional legal resident is one awaiting the issuance of permanent legal resident status. You have non-immigrants, those who basically come here uh, via F1, B1, B2, K1 visas. They enjoy a temporary protected status. And the final category is undocumented or illegal which comes about from illegal entry or overstaying a temporary legal status. People who are in this country without permission or illegally are called undocumented. This means they do not have permission to live in the United States. They are not authorized to work. They have no legal access to public benefits such as healthcare or a driver's license under federal law. 
Any person who is undocumented runs the risk of being deported, of course, and this does create a somewhat stressful and unstable living situation. There are but two ways people can become undocumented. That is first to overstay a legal temporary visa. The second is to enter the United States without going through a legal port of entry. 8 U.S.C. 1324 makes it a federal felony to harbor, conceal, encourage, or induce anyone to enter or remain in the United States in violation of law, or to aid, abet, or conspire with others to engage in any activity in the furtherance of any such activity. I cannot approve any language that says we sanction illegal activity, nor do I believe others should. For six years after my second retirement from a career in law enforcement, which encompassed more than 45 years, much of it at the command or administrative levels, I was assigned on a per diem basis to the U.S. Department of Homeland Security's ICE branch, that's Immigration and Customs Enforcement. I'm familiar with what goes on in Northern New England with regard to problems created by illegal immigration. With regard to immigration, I am the product of legal immigration. My mother came to this country at the age of seven after her father died. My grandmother brought five minor children to this country, raised them, all became US citizens, including my grandmother, who was a truly remarkable woman. She outlived a total of three husbands, accumulating 99 years and 49 weeks worth of life experience before passing. That was the day after the birth of my youngest child over 40 years ago. All of this was accomplished without seeking a dime from this country. My point is that they all followed the legal process and were welcomed into this country in the state of Maine based on their legal status. There is a degree of uncertainty with our immigration laws in this country currently as is evidenced by activity on our southern border. Not with the existence of the laws, but with the ability and desire to enforce them. Currently, our northern border with Canada is closed, but by the Canadian government. If our laws are changed and everyone who crosses our borders does so with impunity and does so lawfully, so be it. I have no problem with that. Until then, we must follow the rule of law. That would be the same thing that we just resolved most recently following the riotous behavior in our nation's capital in January. I've been told that there was no intention on the part of the statement's authors to suborn illegal activity. I certainly hope this is the case, which should mean there would be no objection to amending the statement, which in no uncertain terms as it is represented is not demonstrative of that intent. I thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilor Jensen. Thank you, Mayor Kerr. Um, so I guess first I would support um, passage of this in its original form as presented to us. Um, I guess in the spirit of debate, I would disagree with the notion that this somehow sanctions um, illegal immigration. Um, immigration status, I mean, yeah, there are different types of immigration status, of course, as, as uh, the previous counselor pointed out. Um, I don't think that we should not include immigration status because of one component. Um, I still think if someone's like a legal asylum seeker, they deserve protection and immigration status protects them. Um, and at the end of the day too, like I'm a humanist. Um, if someone's like, if someone comes to the country looking for more opportunity, they're a good person. Um, I would hope that our city treats them with the same exact respect they would treat a citizen that's been here their entire life. I would hope our city is treating every single human being the same way, respectfully, um, with equity, regardless of their immigration status, regardless of if they're here illegally. Um, as a city councilor, I truly hope the city of Lewiston would do that, and I do think we would, and I think this equity statement puts us more in line to do so. Um, so I guess at the end of the day, I, my interpretation of this is not that it sanctions illegal immigration. I don't think this directs our police officers to let elite, you know, someone that's an illegal immigrant go. I, I don't interpret it that way. Um, this doesn't sanction any of our departments to not look into immigration. I mean, we really don't deal with immigration anyways. Um, so I, I just would completely disagree with the, the notion that this somehow sanctions illegal immigration. I've gotten some messages and I've seen some posts online about this. I don't know how this is coming about. Um, I feel like it has more to do with just that issue though. And I'm gonna leave it there. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments from the council? Okay, seeing none to the public. Oops, uh, Council of the Joy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, did we, 
seek legal counsel to review this document uh, from either Lewis and Robin? I'm not aware uh, uh, if Auburn has, but I can tell you, no, we have not had legal counsel review this, this uh, statement. Is there any particular reason that was not accomplished? Um, just did not see any reason uh, based on the language, but uh, you know, it's not a typical process, but we certainly could do that if, if that's a desire of the council. Well, the only reason I'm asking is, is while I served in the legislature, I served eight years on the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. And I found that many times uh, items that came before us uh, were due to uh, the inability of the individuals or the lack of the individuals seeking legal counsel as far as wording and potential outcomes. Uh, I, I like the document. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, it states uh, many positive aspect uh, and so on and so forth. However, I'm, I'm kind of uh, disappointed that it did not go through legal counsel for review. I understand and the staff and the people that were involved in the process, especially the two police chiefs and knowledgeable people uh, from all over the place, uh, including Bates College. Uh, and I'm just surprised that it did not go for a legal review prior to being presented uh, to us. Um, I, I, I guess in that case, I, 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 would, I would make a motion that we table uh, the document at this time and seek legal counsel to review the document. I would feel a lot more comfortable at that time. And that's the only reason that I will do it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Madam Clerk, a motion to table has been made. Uh, there's no discussion on that or is there? Uh, there is a discussion. And if um, a second was made, I missed it. So I apologize no, no. for that. There has okay. not been a second yet. So um, we have a motion on the table. To I would second for discussion. Okay, we have a motion by Councilor Joy, seconded by Councilor Clements. Uh, so now, uh, the only thing, I, and Madam Clerk, correct me if I'm wrong, the discussion now needs to be focused on whether or not to table versus the original motion item. Correct, yes. Okay, so we have four hands raised, uh, and I'll just remind folks it's about the tabling at this point. And I didn't, I didn't see who raised mm -hmm. hands first, so I'm just going to go across the line. Councilor Pettengill. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, it, as you pointed out, that my comments are in, uh, you know, regards to the the motion to table it. Um, Somebody with as much experience and knowledge as Councilor LaJoy and somebody who um, I, I look to as being, um, you know, the, the, the bellwether, you know, the somebody who, who's on this council doing his absolute best to serve the needs of everybody in the city. Um, I, I would strongly support tabling this for a um, for a, a legal review, um, you know, based again, based on his experience and knowledge. Okay, thank you. Councilor Khalid. <clears throat> thank you. Um, I strongly do not support this motion. Um, I have further comments later, but I also would like to hear what the public has to say. Um, but that's, that's how I feel so far. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the motion to table is unnecessary. I don't think anything in this equity statement commits the city to doing anything. It's more of a guide for us and we can develop policies and procedures based off of it. So as far as a legal review, I don't think that there's anything to review, is there? Okay, thank you, Councilor Clement. I would disagree vehemently with that. The wording, irregardless of immigration status, there are but four immigration statuses, one of which is illegal. If you do this irregardless of immigration status, plain and simple, you are including legal and illegal immigration. To the point of uh, Councillor LaJoy's motion to postpone, I would just seek a different wording on that. 
that we postpone this item until such time as Corporation Council can review the matter, report back to the Council in an executive session as a legal matter. Would you entertain such, a, such an amendment, uh, Council of Joy? So, Council of Joy, a friendly amendment to your tabling has been presented. Are you okay with that? You're on mute. You're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> Wrong button. Uh, yes, I think it's a more appropriate language, um, and uh, I would support it. Okay. And Madam Clerk, were you able to document that friendly amendment? Sure, I think so. Uh, to postpone the matter until such time as the city attorney has a chance to review the document and then to report back to the council in an executive session. Okay. Correct. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Councilor Gelinas. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I'm so now there's been a friendly amendment. I, I um, just need would respectfully request from you know, Council of Joy, when you talk about the motion to table and the rationale behind that in seeking legal counsel, I just was trying to get my head wrapped around you, you use the words um, potential outcomes that could happen from this. And I just feel like in order to vote on something, I want to understand better what you're implying. I feel like there's something maybe I'm not getting. And I want to understand when you talk about potential outcomes, what you're referring to directly. And I only ask because if we're going to vote on this. I just. Yeah, um, no, I, I understand uh, the potential outcome. Uh, what I'm looking at is whether the verbiage uh, that is used is uh, one proper and if it'll stand a chance of being challenged. Uh, in court where it would put uh, greater pressure, I guess, on, on the situation. Uh, like I said, I, I think it's a beautiful document. I think everything speaks well. Uh, the only thing is, uh, number one, is I was very surprised uh, that we did not have it reviewed uh, prior to have it presented, even though we had knowledgeable people on the committee, uh, that's understandable. But as I said, I've had many documents come in front of me uh, as I was in the uh, legislature and many, many of the situations were because it had not gone under legal or lawyer review uh, to see how it would stand in the court of law if it came to that. Uh, so I, I just feel that that should happen. I would feel a lot more comfortable. And I think, and I, I can't speak for everyone in the city of Lewiston, but I would think that others would feel just as comfortable if that action were taken. Is that okay? So that helps. It just, it sounds like you're just trying to get broader support by having it reviewed. I understand that better now, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council of Khalid. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, Mayor, is it appropriate for either, um, you know, the two individuals who were on the, on the committee to speak on this as well, or just right now it's just the council? Right, at this point, uh, who, who do you mean? So do you mean like- Like, you know, Father Ms. also, Father Ms. Hussein, Brian O'Malley's, as a panelist in here, um, especially with the wording, I, I just want to see, I think, you know, the equity statement. It's just, it's more than just the word immigration status. And um, it's very unfortunate that we missed the point or several counselors here have missed the point of the equity statement. And the word immigration status is very inclusive of all people. Um, and the word illegal, as some individuals are referring to, is very dehumanizing. So again, I, I you know, very much opposed to this and um, just wondering if it's appropriate for other people to speak on it too. All right, so, so thank you. Uh, Point so, of order, Mr. Mayor. 
Hold on one second. So I, I think where we're discussing the tabling matter, uh, at this point, we'll keep it with the council. And then I will offer the opportunity for the city administrator or Chief O'Malley to uh, chime in their thoughts. Uh, okay. Uh, your point of order? You've, uh, you've resolved that. Thank you. I believe uh, a tabling motion is a subsidiary motion as such will be addressed by the governing body. Yep, thank you. Councilor Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I guess um, I, I wasn't really asking it rhetorically. Um, what in the document itself commits the city to doing anything? Because I know it was just mentioned like something could potentially be challenged in court. Um, can someone literally um, just, like, I can do it right now, read what equity defined is in the statement and then read the statement and once it's read out loud, I think it'll be very clear that there's nothing in there that commits the city to doing anything. It's a guide and it provides the city direction. This is what we should strive to be and how we should strive to approach issues. Um, it's a way that we should view things. It doesn't commit the city to doing anything. So having a legal review to me, like let's just read it out loud and if anything commits the city, we'll all hear it and we'll see it. But I have it right in front of me. I just read it again. It doesn't commit the city to doing anything. So I think just <laughs> stalling this for a legal review um, I, I just completely disagree. It's good in its form right now. It's good as is. There's a lot of work that's been put into it. We should pass it as is. Okay, thank you, Councilor Jensen. Councilor Clement. Mr. Mayor, I can perhaps resolve this issue very quickly. I would be willing to withdraw my second to the motion to table if words to the effect, regardless of legal immigration status, were put in place on this, I would agree with it. I would not go along with the entire sentiment of it, but I would vote in favor of it with that wording change. Until yeah. then, I would renew my second. Right. I, well, one, I think we have to deal with the table in motion because if well, we, I could withdraw that if uh, if somebody is willing to make an amendment. Right. The problem is, is we can't talk about that amendment until we deal with the motion that's on the table. And Madam Clark, please correct me if I'm wrong. Well, um, and Councilor LaJoy was the original maker of the motion. So I think he would really need to be the one to withdraw, to take it off the table for then the original motion to come back before us to then amend any wording in the actual uh, statement. Right, and then we'll find ourselves that if it doesn't go in the direction that Councilor Clement is hoping that we're again, then gonna have another motion to table. Uh, Right, so it might be smoother just to deal with the motion on the table um, and see how that plays out and then go from there. Right, and I, 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 I agree with that as well. Uh, okay, Councilor Clement, did you have any other comments? No, that's the one comment that I would have. If that, that wording change, I could go along with it, but without it, certainly not. Okay, Councilor Khalid? Um, can, can Kathy read the entire statement? Yes, uh, I think that would be appropriate under the table in motion. Correct, Madam Clerk? Sure, that would be fine. So people have a, a clarity of how they would like to vote on the motion. Yes, and uh, you know, for the record, Councilor Jensen, we, I was gonna go in that direction. I just wanted to let people raise their, get through their raised hand. So Madam Clerk, if you could do that, that'd be great. Sure, equity statement. The city of Lewiston is committed to equity through intentional continuous reflection and action, the city and our community systems, including education, employment, healthcare, housing, law enforcement, businesses and beyond are dedicated to addressing and dismantling systems of inequity while working together to build resilient and accessible communities where people of all cultures and identities can thrive. We acknowledge that without an intentional focus on equity, we will continue to perpetuate and deepen in inequality, injustice and harm. The city of Lewiston recognizes that the, those struggling with the impacts of systemic and persistent forms of discrimination, poverty and lack of opportunity continue to be stigmatized, marginalized and excluded from accessing institutions and quality services needed that promote health, safety and well-being. Equity in the city of Lewiston requires a steadfast commitment to one another. The cornerstone of safeguarding equal opportunity is the ability to access resources, municipal services and educational programs, regardless of identity, wealth or social standing. Equity is fair and inclusive for all members of our community. 
and ensuring that equal opportunity exists and voices are heard and valued from those traditionally underrepresented. Here, the city endeavors to create an environment where everyone is treated fairly, respectfully, and embraced, regardless of their race, ethnicity, religion, national origin, gender identity, marital or familial status, immigration status, sexual origin, I'm sorry, sexual orientation, age, economic status, disability, or other individual identities expressed and experienced. The city of Lewiston has a pivotal role in achieving these goals and creating a sense of welcoming and belonging to everyone. We work together to create an equitable environment for all. Okay, thank you. I remind council we're on the table in motion at this point. Is there any other comments uh, in reference to that from the council? Seeing none, call the roll. Councilor from Ward 7. You're muted. Yes. Thank you. Ward 1. Absolutely no. Ward 2. Yes. Ward 4. Yes. Ward 5. No. Ward 6. Yes. Motion passed by a vote of 4 to 2. Okay, uh, so this item has been tabled uh, and city administrator will prepare to have the document reviewed. Okay, uh, so I realized there were some attendees in the public that had their hands raised uh, and the item has been tabled at this point and that didn't allow for public comment, but we will get this back on the agenda as quickly as possible. So we'll do the due notice so that everybody uh, hopefully will, will come back. I do believe this is a document that uh, overall the city council supports, but I do think we have to have, uh, have to take a couple of steps. So uh, all the work by the city spirit, uh, uh, is recognized, I think, by this council as some really good work. And we'll see you all back soon on that equity statement. So thank you. Uh, and thank you, Fatuma and the chief for jumping into the council meeting. Okay, agenda item number 10, please. Item number 10, annual appointments for the Lewiston Auburn Railroad Company Board of Directors. There are a couple items for requested action. The first item is to review the applications and to nominate members to serve on the Lewiston and Auburn Railroad Company Board of Directors to seat one, seat two, seat three, and seat four. So moved. Okay, I need a second. Well, actually, Mr. Mayor, we need to have some um, nominations. You have six applicants that okay. were included in your packet to our uh, requesting reappointment. Uh, Jeff Goslin and Kristen Cloutier have served on the board for a number of years and their terms are up and they've applied for reappointment. And then we have two openings on the board. Uh, two members had to resign because they either moved out of the city or had scheduling conflicts. So we do right. have four seats to fill. And we have six applicants. All right, thank you. So I'm gonna to recommend to the council that we address the two folks that are currently on the board and asking for a reappointment. Uh, so Mr. with Mayor, that, Councilor Clement. I would move that Kristen Cloutier and Jeff Goslin be reappointed to the board and further move that John Clifford and Paul Robinson be appointed as two new members of the railroad board. Okay, we have uh, a move by Councilor Clement uh, that Kristen Cloutier, Jeff Goslin, Paul Robinson, and John Jack Clifford be appointed. Do I have a second? Mr. Mayor. Councilor LaJoy. Uh, I think it prior to doing that, wouldn't it be appropriate to possibly hear from those individuals uh, before we move it for appointment and vote on it? Hear from the applicants? If they're available and if they wish to speak? Yeah, they're not. I don't, they're not attending the meeting. Okay, so, I just, I just thought it was, you know, something that I should put forward and give them the opportunity. Very good. Okay, so we have a motion on four people. 
does somebody want to second that has a batch of four or does somebody want to second the two reappointments? I'll second the four appointments, Mr. Mayor. Okay, we have a motion on the table to uh, appoint Kristen Flutia, Jeff Goslin, Paul Robinson, and John Jack Clifford, moved by Councilor Clement, seconded by Councilor Joy. Any council discussion? Councilor Jensen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will ask if the council will allow me to recuse myself as I am related to one of the nominees. Okay, thank you. I don't hear any objection from the council on that. Uh, abstention is probably where we would go with that. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comment from the council? And Mr. Mayor, if I could just clarify um, with Councillor Clement, uh, we have the four seats up. Two of the seats are for three-year terms and two of the seats are for two-year terms. Would you be recommending that the two up for reappointment have the longer terms of the two-year terms and then the two newer ones filling the vacancies have the two two-year terms? Just the reverse. I would recommend that uh, Kristen Cloutier and uh, Jeff Goslin be appointed to terms that would expire in April of 2023. Okay. And that Mr. Clifford and Mr. Robinson be appointed for the longer of the two terms. Thank you. Okay, with that clarification, are there any questions or comments from the council? Seeing none to the public. Back to the council, Councilor Khalid. Um, Mayor, how many people have applied to this? Uh, I think six total, right? Yes, yeah, six people have applied, Councillor, and you have um, applications, their applications in your uh, background material? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, call the roll. Sure. Um, Councillor from Ward 7? Yes. Word one. Yes. Word two. Yes. Word four. Yes. And word six. Yes. Thank you. So that's for the slate of nominees, Mr. Mayor. Then the next item for requested action is to adopt the resolve regarding the appointments as Lewiston directors on the Lewiston and Auburn Railroad Company Board of Directors. Okay, thank you. I'll entertain a motion. So move. Second. Moved by Councilor Joy, seconded by Councilor Clement. Any questions or comments? Seeing none to the public. Back to the council. Call the roll, please. Council from Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. And Ward 6? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 5 to 0. Okay, thank you. So was that action and actually in, in agenda item 10, the second one? Yes, it's the um, actual um, resolve. It's the, basically, it was a fill in the blank resolve because we didn't know the names that were going to be suggested. Okay. And so agenda item number 11. Thank you. Agenda item number 11, resolve recommending the appointment of a proxy to vote the shares of the Lewiston directors of the Lewiston Auburn Railroad Company as a single block as determined by the majority of the Lewiston directors. Um, again, this also requires two pieces of requested action. The first one is to nominate a Lewiston director from the Lewiston and Auburn Railroad Company to serve as the proxy to cast the vote on behalf of the shareholders at the upcoming Lewiston Auburn Railroad Company annual meeting. Move for passage, Mr. Mayor. Do we actually need a name on this one? Um, you do, uh, because you're nominating someone to serve. The agenda cover sheet does point out that Lincoln Jeffers has held that role in the past for the city. He serves as an ex officio member to the board um, as the city staff person and has uh, held that position for a number of years. Uh, but certainly the, the council can nominate any uh, member of the railroad board. I feel uh, Mr. Jeffers is an excellent guy to run a railroad. Therefore, I move for passage as his, uh, his being proxy. 
a railroad proxy, something new to add to his resume. Okay, we have a motion by Councilor Clement. I'll entertain a second. I'll second the motion. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the council to the public? Back to the council. Call the roll, please. Council from Word 7? Yes. Word 1? Yes. Word 2? Yes. Word 4? Yes. Word 5? Yes. And Word 6? Yes. Motion passed by vote of um, 6 to 0. Okay, thank you. The second half. The next item is to approve the resolve recommending the appointment of a proxy to vote the shares of the Lewiston directors of the Lewiston Auburn Railroad Company as a solid block as determined by the majority of the Lewiston directors. I'll entertain a motion. Move for passage. I'll entertain a second. Second. <laughs> All right, thank you. Moved by Councilor Clement, seconded by Councilor Gelinas. Any questions or comments from the council? To the public? Back to the council. Call the roll, please. Council from Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. And Ward 6? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 6 to 0. Okay, thank you. Uh, agenda item number 12, which is an annual motion. Item number 12, annual authorization for the Public Works Department to post certain roads from March 17th to May 1st, prohibiting vehicles having a gross vehicle weight of over 23,000 pounds. Requested action to approve the order authorizing the Public Works Department <laughs> to prohibit vehicles with a gross vehicle weight greater than 23,000 pounds from certain roads for the period from March 17, 2021 to May 1st, 2021. Okay, thank you. I want to take a motion. So moved. Second. Okay, moved by Councilor Khalid, seconded by Councilor Gelinas. Questions or comments from the council? Councilor Clement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I believe this is a requirement of state statute that the municipal officers approve this. Is there a way that we can give a blanket authorization so that our public works director in concert with the city administrator can go ahead? I noticed that the roads have been posted now for a couple of weeks. Uh, yeah. You know, and if, if it's not authorized, then what good is the posting? Uh, there's plenty of people that don't pay any attention to the posting anyway out in my neighborhood. I've noticed that. Uh, for the last several years, the roads out there in some instances are terrible this time of year. Uh, they're just like a sponge and you get a, you know, a 40,000 pound gravel truck riding over them and it does not help them. So if we could somehow put some teeth behind this by having a city administration do this and notify us, not have to seek permission. Is that, is that permissible somehow? Uh, we, we can check Councillor Clement for the future, but my understanding is, is that the municipal officers are required to vote on this. And even if we had it as an annual item uh, every other January for all of those authorizations you do, sometimes new roads might be added to the list and sometimes road, roads might be removed from the list and then may not be known until February or March when Public Works brings it forth. So we as municipal officers have to vote on each individual road that's posted? No, because we're presenting them as a block, as a group, but you have the list of roads in your council order and you're adopting the order and it does outline the roads or, or the sections of roads. All we're trying to do is remove some red tape. Apparently can't do that, so. Okay, thank you. you any, other, any other questions or comments from council? Marianne, I know you want to get right in there, but I'm not sure we'll need that unless you you really, okay. <laughs> All right, uh, seeing no uh, comments or questions from counselors uh, to the public. Back to the council, call the roll, please. Councilor from Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. And Ward 6? Yes. Motion passed by vote of six to zero. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Director Brechnik, for attending tonight's meeting. Uh, much appreciated.
Okay, uh, agenda item number 13. Reports and updates. I'm surprised Councilor Ray didn't call in for this agenda item. <laughs> All right, any other reports or updates? All right, thank you. Agenda item number 14. Any other business councilors or others may have relating to Lewiston city government? All right, thank you. Uh, Councilor Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to speak to uh, Jeremy Bloom spoke during our public comment. Um, some of us might remember he emailed us probably about a year ago or so, um, speaking of issues down in Little Canada, uh, like visibility issues, um, just not looking great, trash in different places. Um, I did visit the area he mentioned, um, you know, about a year ago within the week that he, he emailed us. And yeah, I was pretty, um, I was not really happy to see what I saw too. And he was spot on about that. And so it's still dealing with this a year later. I'm not happy to hear that. So um, I've actually, because I lived in the downtown for three years, I've recently moved to, you know, the suburb just outside of it. Um, but there are definitely some issues that I don't think that we as a council are quite aware of that only people kind of living downtown would get the experience of. Um, like, for example, there are a lot of dumpster issues, dumpsters just not looking good, not looking good for the city in some really visible places. Um, so not, not just dumpsters themselves, but how trash cans are placed, how trash is just thrown on the ground, how it's not placed in, in uh, cans and all of that. Um, like if you look at the dumpster behind, um, you know, kind of by the, there's one by the canal. I'm not, I don't want to go into specific ones here. I won't now at this point in time, but there are definitely a lot of issues that Mr. Bloom has talked about that I don't think that we're fully addressing as a city. Um, I didn't have much traction when I started, tried to get the conversation started a year ago about some of the, the like, image in the city and the, the trash and the cleanliness a lot of the stuff that Mr. Bloom talked about. So um, I guess if any other counselors are interested, feel free to get a hold of me. And I'd, I'd love to get this conversation going about how we can make the downtown look a little bit better. So when people come to visit, it'll improve their experience. And as I've said multiple times, that's how we're gonna change Lewiston's reputation. It's not with a marketing campaign. It's not by telling people who we are. It's by showing them and giving them a great experience every single time. Um, so for Mr. Bloom, if you're listening, I do hear you. I'm still very much concerned about the same things you are a year from now, a year from when you first reached out to us. And so um, if there's any interest in the council, I'd, I'd love to get working on this with you guys. But as okay, far sure. as I know, anything that I've, I've recommended, I've, I felt alone on. So if this is something we want to tackle, I'm sure it fits in with our goals um, and a few different goals. So yeah, thanks. Council of Gelinas. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I was actually going to comment on that same post. So I've been going back and forth with Mr. Bloom as well. And if I'm being frank, I have felt very frustrated that he's not getting resolved to this because he's come at it at so many different angles. Um, and so, you know, I definitely would love to join forces with you, Councillor Jensen, um, to see if there's anything we can do. I know that you offered up some help, Councillor Clement, um, but definitely very, very concerned. And, and um, I encouraged him to, to come tonight and share this public comment. Okay, thank you. Councillor Khalid. Thank you. A different issue. Two things. So I was looking through the city website and under the tab of like immigrant and refugee working group um, policy development, I would like the city to look at that again because it's outdated um, and the membership is, there's like a lot of different people that are on there that are no longer um, part of the city council. Um, so that is one thing. And another thing is regarding the equity statement that the rest of my colleagues have tabled. Dennis, can you give us a day that it will be on the agenda again? I certainly, uh, I can't give us a solid day because I will need to get the legal review and timeline, but I will certainly try um, for the next regular meeting. So in two weeks would certainly be the goal at the latest that we would have it on there um, at the next regular meeting. Again, it just comes down to legal review time and, and getting that, but I would expect we can meet that timeline. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Clement. Quick question now that Councilor Khalid has raised an issue. This will be presented to us after legal review and executive session for further discussion. That was the motion I believe to table to a time specific. Yes. Okay. Uh, I just want to speak briefly to Councillor Jensen and Councillor Gelinas. Immediately after Mr. Bloom's letter, I believe it was uh, approximately a year ago, I toured that neighborhood uh, as a former public safety official. Man, that, that it gave me the creeps to go through there to look at the potential 
the things that could happen. Uh, the things that he elicited were very plain, very plainly visible. And to think that he is still exhibiting problems like that a year later, I'm dismayed to say the least. Uh, seems to me that we could be doing better for him and for the city and for the other residents of that area. Um, I can only imagine what some of them are going through. Uh, he, I believe, is a landlord. If I understood him, and he was in and out on volume, so it was very difficult uh, to ascertain exactly what he was saying from this uh, uh, vantage point. But I believe that a lot of these things are occurring in a building that he owns. And that's what I brought up. Uh, I would be more than happy to point out things that he could probably do to help himself in those situations. But I also think the city can get involved. But he as a landlord has got some control over those issues. Uh, unless he's not a proper landlord. I, by way of explanation, I used to teach a landlord tenant law seminar for the New Hampshire Sheriff's Association. And landlords are not completely powerless. They may feel that way from time to time, but uh, there is help available to them. So I concur with what uh, Councillor Jensen said. I know that'll shock him, but I, uh, I, do, con I do concur with him and Councillor Gelinas. And uh, there's three of us that think we ought to be doing something about that. So hey, I don't know hey. whether they ought to workshop it, uh, get code and police and fire involved or how we want to handle it. But I think it'd be an excellent, excellent use of our time. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, for the comment prompted a thought. Can, for legal review for the equity statement, can we um, ask our legal team uh, or lawyers specifically, does this obligate the city to do anything? I, I, I want a clear yes or no answer at our next meeting. Okay. And, and uh, just uh, Councilor Clement brought up the executive session, but on the same evening, we will go to the public with this, correct? Councilor, uh, City Administrator Dote. Yes, that would be the intent. I think there would be an executive session to provide legal counsel as requested through the motion. Um, and then it would be on the agenda um, to take action. All right, thank you. Councilor Khalid. That was my question, thank you. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other updates? Councilor Clement. Just uh, for Councilor Jensen, I'm not certain that the uh, statement would obligate us to do anything other than to be viewed as potentially an immigration sanctuary city. You want that label? You know, that that's that's part of it right there. Yeah, I don't think there's anything in that. If so, one, I, I, that's an, really, we shouldn't be going down that road. Okay, uh, well, I, I withdraw my comments and uh, let's move on to the next issue. We'll have legal review. All right, thank you. Uh, so I'll entertain a motion to enter into two executive sessions. So moved. Okay, it's been moved that we, oh, uh, uh, actually I'm gonna pass this off to Madam Clerk to read the two motions or requested actions. Sure, um, the requested action for agenda for number 15 is to enter into an executive session pursuant to MRSA Title I Section 4056D to discuss labor negotiations regarding the Maine Association of Police Patrol Unit. And I apologize, I didn't bother to print out of number 16 for myself since that was a late entry. So if someone else has that, if they could read that motion for me, I, I just don't have that paper right here. I don't either, but I, it's in reference. Can. Oh, thank you. Um, to enter into an executive session pursuant to MRSA Title I, Section 4056E to discuss a legal matter. I think it's the same. Nope, it's not. Give me another. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> to enter into an executive session pursuant to MRSA Title I, Section 4056D to discuss labor negotiations regarding the Maine Association of Police uh, Patrol Unit. I'll second that motion. Okay, thank you. Moved by Councilor Khalid, seconded by Councilor LaJoy. Call the roll, please. Councilor from Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Word four? Yes. Word five? Yes. And word six? Yes. Motion passed by vote of six to zero. Brief recess, Mr. Mayor? Yes, uh, let's take 10 minutes. Well, we can go briefer than that, but uh, 10 is fine. Okay, we'll go with 10. <laughs> Thank you.
Wait, should we leave the meeting? Yeah, should you say goodbye to the public? Oh. Yeah, this concludes the uh, city council meeting. We're not expecting any actions out of these uh, executive sessions.